Hi everyone. Today we'll be talking to my friend and colleague Simon Keenan. Simon is the head of business and hospitality here at Luxemana and he's originally from New Zealand. So prior to this role, he's been teaching all around the world in countries such as Japan and the UK, and he's here to tell us all about his international adventures. So thank you so much for joining us, Simon. Thank you for having me, uh, Elaine. Great to be here. Thank you. First question. How did you get into education as a career? Oh, um, complicated, but I'll, I'll give you a quick way down. Um, so I met my wife at university and she was studying um, education. Um, and I had a couple of spare modules up my sleeve for my politics degree and my economics degree. Um, so to hang out with her a bit more, I kind of just put those, I uh, started taking a couple of education modules. Um, and that was great. Um, I didn't really have any fascination with being a teacher at that point, but it gave me a little bit of a background in, especially training actually, um, that's what most of my education modules were on. Then I got picked up by a bank, um, a graduate recruitment scheme. I got picked up by a bank um, and I was an investment advisor for a bank for um, the first nine months. And then as a young guy and I decided that wasn't really for me, uh, probably would be a lot richer if it was for me right now, um, but, um, but it wasn't for me. And so I spoke to uh, the HR manager and for any positions available outside of investments, um and they kind of did a few uh psychometric tests on me and things like this to because they wanted to keep me and then they decided i might be suitable for a training development consultant at the bank um so that was my first kind of touch uh, taste into uh training and development and education and my role there was to create training programs uh internal training programs for westpac bank um which i did um, and then from there, I uh, took on another another role um, in the UK training and development as well with a then famous company called Alcatel, a uh, phone company. Um, and then I took a hi hiatus from uh, training and education. Um, and I actually started working on designing, B well not designing, but uh, doing the contracting for uh, BMX tracks for the Olympics in the UK. Uh, so I was part of the financial team for that. I'm uh, trying to, to get a tender for this BMX track. It ended up, we didn't get the tender, we overspent and everyone got sacked. Um, and I still had, um, I still had six months left on my UK visa. Um, and so then uh, my wife, who's then my girlfriend, but she was working um, at Brewers Hill Middle School um, just in Dunstable there, and there's a technical college called Northfields Technical College, um, and so they used to have group meetings and stuff, and they were looking for someone to uh, do a couple of business modules for kind of O, o level and then not quite A level kind of standard. Uh, it's technical college, a bit different to what we have here. Um, and so she recommended me, and then I got into formal teaching there um, for, it was six months, and then it ended up being a year because they extended me for six months and I wasn't quite ready to go. Um, and then from there, we'd had enough of the UK, so we decided to take gigs over in Japan teaching. Um, and so we spent a year in Japan teaching and then came back to New Zealand and all these little things just add up for me for where I am now. That's why I'm giving you kind of the, the background. Um, and we came back to New Zealand and I started working for the Department of Building and Housing. And my job there was working in the tenancy tribunal. Um, and I was to train first time tenants and uh, landlords into their rights and responsibilities under the Residential Tenancies Act. So I did that until we had an earthquake. Um, and then my job changed to answering phones and dealing with earthquakes and stuff. And then we're working like 20 hours a day. Uh, and it was not ending and I kind of burnt out. And then my wife took a job in Brunei, um, just teaching English and I was gonna have a year off to recover from the trauma of dealing with an earthquake, not being in an earthquake, but dealing with the, with the fallout of everyone's houses falling down. Um, and then I was um, at, a, at a gathering and the head of IT was at this gathering, I never met him before. And basically we started talking and then he offered me a job doing some professional development um, and e-commerce training with students at Luxemburg College. And the rest, they say, is history. 
so yeah, uh, all these little things added up basically is what I'm saying to to uh, like nearly fate, I guess. Mm. So actually, my next question was, what made you want to work internationally? But it just kind of seemed like decisions at the time that were like the best decisions. But what made uh, you want to leave like your home country? Um, for me, um, I've always been adventurous. Uh, it's part of who I am. I'm a, definitely a risk taker by, by nature, right? Um, and I really wanted to get to the UK. I did my uh, dissertation for political science on the punk rock movement, uh, which which came from uh, the UK and uh, the fallout around that and the, the political ramifications. So I kind of fell in love with punk rock. Um, and as a result of punk rock, I wanted to go and, you know, check out London and check out where the whole thing was kind of born. Uh, my wife is British citizen, well, late wife is British citizen as well, so that made her want to go there. Um, and we had enough of the UK and then we're like, I don't want to go back to New Zealand. Like New Zealand's a bit like Brunei, you gotta, you got to think of it like we're a small country and we're very isolated and our worldview isn't great as citizens, right? Um, because you just don't see the rest of the world. Like you, you are in a, a bubble kind of. Uh, so we went to the UK and we really loved Europe and I, you know, backpacked Europe and really opened our eyes. And then we wanted to just do something different. And we had no love for Japan at all. Um, there was nothing about Japan um, in particular. We knew nothing about it really, apart from that they were paying us far too much money for kind of cushy jobs. <laughs> so we, we jumped on an aeroplane and we're actually in Turkey when we got the call from this company that wanted to hire us. So we left all our stuff in the UK and just took our backpacks through from Turkey straight to Japan to start working like seven days later. And um, yeah, so, and then to come to Brunei, um, again, just we never wanted to settle down really. You know, um, kids and mortgages and all that kind of stuff weren't a thing for us and yeah. Oh, that sounds really nice. So it's mm. good to explore everywhere, explore the world. Um, I know that you've taught different age groups. So which are the different age groups that you've taught? And do you have a preference for any particular so, yeah, one? Um, so predominantly, most of my most of my education experience has been between this kind of what I'm teaching now between 17 and and 20s, right? Um, but I was in a unique experience at, when I was in Japan where I was teaching uh, kindergarten students English and then doing uh, business lectures in English to university students. So it's quite, it was quite a funny dynamic that. Um, high school in the UK or the, high, the technical college, which is kind of equivalent to high school, but a bit different. Um, yeah, that is definitely my, that environment was the most challenging. Uh, definitely the most challenging. Um, <laughs> I, I do like um, our kind of just out of high school level that we have at the college, I find that then the most, um, the easiest and most um, willing to gain knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, Japan, Japan, the young kids was hilarious. They taught me Japanese, so I got paid to teach them English, but actually they taught me Japanese. So that was, <laughs> that was quite fun. Um, yeah, I, I think, I think university, a university and higher, higher education age, that's kind of 17 to 20 something bracket is my preference. Okay. Yeah. Uh do you have any fun stories about your teaching experiences? Oh, um, many, many, um, but but not. Is your your top three then? <laughs> well, it's, it's one of these things where I, I think a, a lot of the interesting stories you are kind of not suitable for our for a public platform. Not that they, there's something necessarily wrong, but it's just not fair to divulge some information, right? Um, cause there's, there's always, uh, there's always a happening behind a story. You know what I mean? <laughs> there's always a happening, but I'll, I'll give you some of my, um, just some of my cute moments, I guess. Um, teaching in Japan, um, after my classes, my, my kindergarten students, and I, I got up and I was just walking out and then I saw all these like four or five year olds run up and they were all smelling my chair. And so I went over, I, I don't know what was happening. And like really nose down, um, sniffing my chair, and so I went over to my my secretary, um, because 
there's always a secretary with a foreign teacher, right? And I asked the secretary, well, what, what's, what's going on? And, and she said, oh, they're smelling your chair to see if it smells like milk. And I'm like, what? And they're like, oh, because they, all young Japanese kids think, think white people smell like milk. And they want to see if the chair smells like milk. So that was a cute little story. Um, yeah. And, and apparently, according to the kids, it definitely smelled like milk, but it definitely didn't. <laughs> um, so that was one. Um, uh, another another nice story, um, and, and this is a Brunei centric one. And it's it's not so much about the the classroom really. It's it's just what our Brunei students are as as people, um, and. Yeah, it will be something that I will I will cherish. Um, so, some of the the listeners here will know that my my wife passed in two thousand and seventeen, and what shocked me, like you know, all my colleagues came around and supported, and and like friends and all that supported, like not like what you'd expect. I'm totally great, grateful for it, but I had Luxemana students, like I don't know, twenty, thirty of them at my house, like helping getting my wife's body back, helping with all these little uh local things and they were just taking care of it and i know for a fact in new zealand this wouldn't happen uh in the uk this wouldn't happen in japan this wouldn't happen right and this is the nature of our students like they are um big family really caring people so you know that, that's a special memory and an unfortunate circumstance but it just shows me like how cool our kids are right um you know um, so yeah, I really, I really cherish that um, as a memory. And then <clears throat> uh, finally, um, the year was 2012, and we had Luxemana Sports Day, and I was a young, fit, strong lad um, 10 years ago. Um, and anyway, we had all these events, um, like proper kind of Olympic style events, you know, your 100 meter sprints and your high jumps and your shot puts and all that. Anyway, I, I ended up winning um, every everything I went for um, comfortably, and, and then uh, the, the students got together and decided to uh, ban me from the prize uh, ceremony. That's because, right. Because that's was, right. So that's teacher. why teachers are banned. <laughs> yes. Um, I was wondering uh, why. Yeah. <laughs> <It's a new. sighs> Yeah, but but now nowadays if I participated I would come last in everything so I think um, but yeah you know I was uh, when I first joined I was like huh how come teachers don't take part in any of these that's why because of you <laughs> yeah probably um I got uh, from the prize the prize ceremony I got two gold medals before they decided to, to ban me from the rest of <laughs> so yeah um, yeah, so I, I I I enjoyed I enjoyed that. Though. I enjoyed the story behind it. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> some some great moments. Um, yeah, the UK. Uh, because you know you're from the UK and you understand the the high school kind of technical college system a bit better. The the stories are a bit grittier coming out of there, uh, especially in the in the lower decile region that I was actually in, uh, just out of Luton there. Um, you know, we had violent parents and just things that you you would never imagine. Um, yeah, pretty tough. Uh, we had, I think they're called travellers, um, traveller parents uh, kind of surrounding the school and harassing teachers because kids had failed or were mean. And um, I, my wife was spat at by students walking home uh, under the instructions of parents. Um, so yeah, it's, a great relief um not to be not to be teaching in these lower decile regions in the uk like there is the kids uh i think they want to learn but their external pressures there are, are phenomenal right and it's, it must be a hard life yeah that's good so brunei is actually good in that sense in that oh brunei is a pleasure to teach. yeah 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 oh the, the kids are lovely right like it's and don't get me wrong, the kids in the UK were lovely too, but just there was a lot of external pressure going on and, you know, uh, the whole sex, drugs and, and alcohol thing is really prevalent there as opposed to here. And, and like, like it does, does make a huge difference in the upbringing of kids and what they're like. Um, 
you know, and you're doing firsthand actually being a British citizen. Like you, 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 you would have lived at high school with all this stuff kind of going on, right? Mm, I think um, I went to a more kind of high end. High uh, yeah, yeah, you're posh. I so I, not posh. <laughs> just uh, kind of that that side was kind of hidden from me because I was a nerd and I didn't have any friends. So <laughs> <laughs> I was just playing video games my entire life. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's get back to the questions. Okay, so can you comment on the different education systems in different countries? Look, they, I can, but it's fundamentally the UK and the Brunei are, are the same, right? And, and we are based off British curriculums, yeah? And the New Zealand is based around, although different, um, slightly different grading structures and things like that, uh, it's still based around uh, the same the same. Um, Japan's slightly different, um, but it's the the attitude of the public towards education is the difference. Um, it, it's it's a it's a stark difference. Um, in Japan, you your life is nothing until you finish university, right? Like you are to study. Um, they. Japanese students will read and read and read and study and study and study. And when they come to college, to you know, to their classes, especially in my my business lessons, I was doing in English, their main priority was to um, was basically for you to say what they had read. That's what they wanted to hear, right? That that you would say what they have spent the last you know one week reading, you know, hundreds and hundreds of pages, um, and uh, as opposed to uh, New Zealand and the UK, uh, the attitude there is to not challenge your teacher, but to to dig deeper and to uh, like, I, again, you might be familiar with this, um, to ask many questions and to get a, a deeper, deeper, deeper understanding of whatever, even though you not you might not be as well read as a Japanese student, um, your <laughs> you can more, I think, uh, philosophically i'll put it like this philosophically i think a western student cares more about the understanding of um a theory than the actual uh, nuts and bolts of that theory right they they want to know why it works right um and then in japan and brunei quite similar in the fact that they want to know and memorize the the facts of a theory or the you know the the facts of something and not so much caring about it how it works in the greater in the greatest context in the greater scheme is less relevant to to them for whatever reason than what it is to a Westerner who cares about the understanding but couldn't care about dates, names, titles, and things like that. You, you know what I mean? Like it's a yeah. it's it's a big philosophical change. But even though that we're working in very similar educational structures, that's really interesting to hear. Uh, uh, that's my opinion. It's not a fact, it, um, but it's, no, it's it, from my experience. It's not a fact, but it's a kind of a generalization of what's happening between the Western and then the Asian world as well. So I actually have been hearing similar stories where Asian education is more about, you know, rote memory, don't yeah. question, uh, just memorize it. And then Western, like American, American is the extreme where they get marks for you know speaking up in class questioning the teacher yeah, yeah. and UK when I grew up um, less so we were kind of told to just memorize stuff as well but you were in the UK education system uh, later than me so probably it's moving in that direction where they're telling people to you know be curious question things Hold on. Oh, yeah. it's CJ. Sorry, we're working from home is a treat. Um, um, yeah, I, I and just for the record, I wouldn't have been my time teaching in the UK. You, you would have been there. Uh, Where just, that much? <laughs> uh, 2000. That old? I think I was teaching 2005, 2006. 2006, I started university. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, yeah. We're, we're, we're close, we're close. Okay. Um, are there any aspects of other education systems you'd like to see in Brunei? So this leads on from the other question. 
Well, I, I think uh, in our preamble before before the recording started, um, yeah, I, I mentioned how um, trades are given far greater emphasis than what they are here. Um, and this is, you know, there's always a catalyst for movement as to why. And um, I think in, in the UK, New Zealand, and Australia, I uh, don't know so much about America, um, but there is such a great emphasis on sign off and technical excellence, right? Um, that in order to be technically excellent, in whether you're a mechanic, a builder, a plumber, um, you really need to train and train and train, right? Now yeah. here we, there are, you know, there are vocational schools here, don't get me wrong. Um, but the, the pr there is a preference and a direction where students will go to higher education rather than further education, right? And if I could see anything change here, I would like our kids who might not end up doing degrees, right? And which is great that they complete their degrees, but a lot of them would have been, um, more emotionally satisfied if they became a builder, right? Um, because you know they're really handy with their hands and they're and they're creative and but the the payment structure here, um, you know, a builder doesn't get paid you know a tenth of what they earn in the UK, like or or a plumber. I think you're doing your own house at the moment. Right? Oh, they get so much money. <laughs> yeah, it's ridiculous, right? Yes. Uh, but they deserve it. Like, who would you rather be stuck on a desert island with? A guy who can build you a house or a lawyer? <laughs> like, like, who's actually more valuable to the world, right? It's um, true. Yeah. Um, they do deserve the pain. They do deserve it. Um, but like, because there is, there isn't uh, the same sort of pay structure as what there is overseas. These yeah. kids that would be wonderful builders and and superb electricians and wonderful plumbers, yeah. they don't have the incentive to go down this route, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so bit, they are, they are in, better off to study a university degree where they can go to the government and, you know, they get a government job and then their salary is paired with their qualification uh, as well. So, you know, that's the incentive. Um, and, and I get it and it's fine, but, uh, you know, uh, I could see it also if we re relied more on uh, localizing our trades rather than importing from Thailand, Indonesia, uh, Philippines. Um, Maybe a minimum wage too. <laughs> yeah, one won't go there. Um, but um, and then and then the thing is, society has to be prepared to pay for these for excellence, right? In, in our traits. Because at yeah. the moment, we are as a society, myself included, uh, myself included. I would rather pay fifteen dollars um, for my aircon to be repaired by someone who may or may not know what they're doing, um, as opposed to an expert. You know, who's um, and the the other thing that we I think, and this is coming through. Uh, I do a lot of work with um, with MPEC, especially on tourism and hospitality, and this is all around skills, vocational further training, right? Um, so MPEC is part of the Prime Minister's Office an initiative to help uh, localize our our workforce. So I'm there um, on, as an education consultant and I'm kind of working alongside IBTE and, and other people with industry, writing curriculums where we can uh, put in the hard skills um, so that people are more industry ready, right? Um, and this will come alongside with technical certificates. Um, now you've got an IT background. As an IT professional, yeah? Uh, and I'm trying to speak your language and I don't know much about your language, yeah? Um, but, but you know, if you were to hire a net, somebody doing net, a networker, right? Who would you rather, you know, forget Brunei context for a moment, but who would you rather employ? Somebody with a Cisco certification or somebody with a degree in IT? Who is more valuable for you? Cisco. Cisco, right? Specific networking. Yeah, I want like, a network. And like, so Cisco, you, you'll be like a three month here, then maybe a six month top up, and then maybe, and, and you go, it's staged, right? And each stage is another capability you have. Hmm. And, and these are technical certificates. And now we, we as a country are not grasping and not holding on to these um, technical certificates enough. I, I would love to see more technical certificates coming in um, and not replacing, but being, um, being used alongside, you know, the more formal 
uh, higher education system. Yeah. Uh, and we need to educate people about these as well. Yeah. So it's not, um, so, you know, specialization is better than, you know, the general, okay, you've done computer science, you know, a little bit about networking, a little bit about programming, a little bit about everything else, you know, project management, but you don't have the in-depph knowledge. Yeah, so uh, well, you, after you, the degree, you can specialize. Yeah, um, like, you know, if you're lucky enough to end up working at, at Shell and a, a few a few of the government organizations, they will they will send you off to Singapore and you will do these qualifications, right? Um, or these certificates, mm -hmm. I should say, um, because they see them as invaluable. But again, as in, in every industry in the private sector, I don't think uh, we are fully grasping onto uh, these modes of professional development. Um, and because the industry is not really holding on to them, then it means that the, the student isn't seeing them as being valuable until they're kind of ordered by, you know, Shell or whoever else they're going on, uh, working for, then they see them as valuable, right? Yeah. Um, like my eye opener was when I was all the way back then, uh, when I was working at the bank and uh, I was in the human resources team, I was doing training and development, but that comes under the human resources uh, blanket, right? And so my boss didn't have a university degree at all. Um, but they had all these stages in CIPT, which is um, professional qualifications for human resource managers, right? And she was brilliant. Like she knew everything. She, because that's, it didn't care about referencing. It doesn't care about um, who said what. It, it's about what you do in this situation to make the, you know, and it's a, it's a, it's a completely different kind of way of thinking of things. So, yeah. Uh, That's a really good initiative. Yeah, really good initiative for Brunei because I do we do see those kind of massive gaps in the job market and the job skills. Yeah, oh, look, and, and I'll tell you, like IBT are doing a great job. Um, and mm. they, they're working really hard. Semio Botech are working really hard um, as well. But again, they, I believe, uh, because at the top end where where the money is going to be made. Um, there's this incentive for these brilliant students who would be brilliant at these things to take on these uh, these technical certificates and technical qualifications. So, you know, uh, we do have them, but I don't think they're emphasised enough. Um, and the, yeah, the technical certificates, especially around IT, um, we, we as a nation, it would be great if we could step up our game on that. Yeah, no, that's really insightful. Okay, so we'll go on to the last question. So finally, do you have any tips for people who are <laughs> considering teaching as a career? Um, I, I think a um, really smart man said to me once upon a time, um, when you're teaching, uh, you, are <clears throat> you are putting people on the right path rather than trying to make them memorize things, right? Now, I think if you are uh, somebody who nearly a perfectionist, teaching will be difficult for you because you will never get perfection out of a student, right? Never. Um, you, <laughs> and <clears throat> what you will come to realize is that a student not being perfect might actually mean that they're better and brighter and than what you are, right? Um, you have uh, teachings, you have to be able to put your perspective on things aside and you have to be very patient. And if you're not patient and if you can't um, see empathy, empathy, if you don't have empathy and you're not patient, I think teaching will be a pretty hard job for you. Um, I also think that you need to be prepared to learn uh, more than you teach um, from, you know, because a teacher, you are you are a counselor whether you like it or not right you are, you are a counselor um and then you are a mediator and you are you know you are a subject matter expert and you know uh you are just everything uh, for you know three hours or five hours whatever you're teaching in a day you are everything um and if you're not prepared to put everything into it then you're not going to be the kids won't be getting everything out of you um and that's not fair on them so it's it, i wouldn't quite say it's selfless like you know you're, you're not uh, you're not going to war and fighting for your country it's not as selfless as that but it is um you are you have to be prepared to put yourself second often 
um yeah the, the, that's i don't know how do you feel about it uh, you're, you're a teacher um uh, I think you, a lot of patience a lot of patience <laughs> um, yeah um and i think it's important is it like what i've discovered and you've heard about like you know kind of my my life um teaching is a passport to the world and i think i think um that's something that anyone the if you're curious about worlds and society and culture, no better way of getting in tune with the culture than teaching. That's true. You have very transferable skills, oh, very. especially if you teach something like um, English as a foreign language. So that that's pretty much a passport to every country. Oh, oh indeed, indeed, indeed it is. Mm. Okay, thank you so much, Simon. It's been super insightful talking to you. Um, I've learned so much from you. Um, yeah, thank you for the listeners for listening all the way up until this point. <laughs> yeah. So we'll thank see you next time. Thank you for having me. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.